Well, this morning we're returning to the hugely important question that we raised yesterday. Why the Word? As it's been inspired for me in our work in Glasgow with refugee people, all from Muslim backgrounds, we have learned to deal honestly with Bible issues from Muslim background people and how these are actually critical learning issues for Christians as well. And as I told you yesterday, some of my colleagues said, this stuff we're learning is necessary for even ardent Christians who need to be reminded of key truths that make the Christian faith unique. It's comparable in higher level research, you can have something called an interlocutor, somebody you converse with, compare, contrast, and in that way, that's what we're doing with Islam as a means of thinking about central truths of Christian faith and particularly scripture. In that sense, we focus on particular issues that arise in honest comparison between the teachings of Islam, looking at the content of the Quran, and also, even more important, what is called the Hadith, sayings of the Prophet, commentaries more or less by Islamic scholars about the Quran and the statements of Muhammad, and the main tenets of Christianity as attested to by Bible-affirming scholarship and study. Yesterday I suggested that I think the obvious place to begin is the Bible itself, for which we began to look at one major passage in the Bible, and now coming back this morning to this very important teaching about what the Bible says about itself that we come to here in 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. It happens to be the theme verses for Chehi, and so it's all connecting quite well. So I want to read those again with you if you have a Bible. I just love it that you're not allowed phones when you're at Chehi, so you actually, except for a few recalcitrant faculty, <laughs> um, you have to actually have a real printed Bible. So turn to that with me, 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. As you're turning there, I just want to apologize. I had a little tickle in my throat before we got on the airplane. It is not COVID, please don't worry. But it kind of got worse through travel and it's now in the last stages, but I sound a little gruff. Uh, that's why, but please don't worry about it. So, verses 14 to 17, 2 Timothy 3. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be fully capable or adequate equipped for every good work. In our chapel time yesterday, we focused entirely on verse 16 and what it means that the Bible says about itself that it is inspired by God and how this applies, as it says so emphatically, to all Scripture. Today, then, we want to move on in this text, verse 16, and now into verse 17. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, rebuke, correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully adequate, equipped for every good work. This critical passage makes clear to us, doesn't it, that the knowledge of the Bible, please hear me, Chamber Fest students, this is so really important, that the knowledge of the Bible, even all scripture, is not an end in itself. No, but what does the very end of verse 17 say? So that the man or woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. It is meant 
to equip you, not just be knowledge in your brain. As good as that is, important as that is, that's not the end of it. Good use of scripture in your life and in a good and healthy Christian community like Chehi Summer School of Music is aimed at, is meant to equip you like a good doctor, a good teacher, a good parent, a good musician. You can only be good at it if you are equipped properly, which I think is why you're here in terms of music. The idea here is to give you everything you need, the term equipped, give you everything you need in order to do an important job. You cannot do the job if you are not properly equipped for it. And what does the text here say that we are meant to be equipped for? For achieving self-satisfaction, self-centered, idealistic lifestyle of the modern family with a white picket fence and a nice fireplace and two-car garage and all that. Is that what you're equipped for? For achieving a place of dominance over others? For achieving even theological prowess, you could say, or biblical superiority? No, no, it says that God wants us to be equipped for every good work. And the emphasis here is threefold, isn't it? It's quite a simple statement, equipped for every good work. One is that it is a work. That means it's tangible. It can be experienced. It is practical. It is not just theory. It is not just belief. Music theory only comes to life when you play it, not just theorize about it, as important as that is. I launch the theory classes, don't get me wrong. But many, many Christians, I think, believe that their faith is all about what they have in their head, what they believe. More or less like a theory. But it's not just an idea, it is rather an expression of Christian faith that actually produces physical and emotional and communal change for every good work. Second, it is that which contributes to that which can honestly be described as how does it describe it? Good. Equipped for every good work. Here, the original language is agathos, translates tov from Hebrew as under the shalom umbrella of God's objectives in the world. Tov, good. It is part of God's overall design to bring wholeness, goodness, harmony through the Prince of Shalom, Jesus himself, Prince of Peace. Ministry, in other words, that actually contributes goodness, blessing, health, and wholeness to the inhabitants of the world around us, to your friends, your colleagues, your family members, the people in your community. Not at all anything that is ugly, or harmful, or destructive, but tov, agathos, good in accord with all that speaks of God's shalom purpose for his creation. And then third, this is equipping that is hugely 
inclusive in the broadest terms, in the broadest scope. For what does it say? Equipped for every good work. Of course, it must include and in some situations prioritize spiritual needs of human beings. But every means everything that produces good for people. Schooling needs, medical needs, psychological needs, legal needs, family needs, social cultural needs, and including creative, artistic needs of the human soul. This is part of the good. In our work in Scotland, we have a huge time and effort given to helping refugees with legal needs. Standing up for them, vying for their right to live in a new world for them. And it takes huge time and effort to say the good we're after is your legal situation. And on and on we could go so that we could genuinely say that scripture is shaping us so that we are equipped for every good work. And in this interlocutor with the teachings of Islam, I have to simply and objectively tell you that this is very different from the goals and purposes of the Quran. This is just not the case with the Quran. The overriding goal of the Quran is what Islamic scholars refer to as Tawheed, which is really simply a cerebral affirmation of monotheism. If you can simply cerebrally say there is one God, that's all you need. Now, it should be said that this can also lead to real heart conviction. I know Islamic peoples who have a genuine concern for others around them. But in terms of the aims and the goals of the Quran itself, this is not actually necessary or expected. The goal of Quranic teaching is simply a verbal declaration of shahada, the profession verbally that there is only one God worthy of worship, and he is revealed by Muhammad. The Bible's goal on the other hand, is that all scripture should so shape individuals, churches, communities, social and cultural norms such that every good work is the result. For that task of touching the, word, the world around us with every good work, Verse 17, as we back up in it a wee bit, teaches that all scripture is meant to so work in us, so shape us, that we are actually fully fitted for ministry. That is what it actually means when it says at the beginning of verse 17, that the man of God may be adequate. It is the New Testament Greek word artiso, artios, excuse me, artios, and it means capable, fitted. Better translations now read it as fully capable. And it suggests to us the creative work, artios, coming from artistic. It lends itself to English, Greek becomes. The English idea of that which is artistry or artistic. That the living scriptures perform in us that actually fits us for particular works of ministry. That you are uniquely qualified and equipped for. That are unique to your or my various personalities, backgrounds, histories, culture, all that makes us human beings. But in some ways, translating this as adequate, as it generally was for many years, is actually healthy. To say that God wants you to be prepared 
adequately, not perfectly. It's not about perfection, but simply fitted for particular works of ministry. I find that quite liberating. I want to give it my best, I want to give it all that I can, but the ideal of perfection is kind of defeating. You do not need to be perfect, but simply uniquely fitted, adequate for serving God in accord with who you are. Your gifting, your personality, your style, your background, your brand of the best that you can give, but not perfection as you measure it in comparison with someone else. Most struggles with, compare, uh, with perfection come from someone else that we compare ourselves and we're not quite there. And how prevalent that is for musicians, for artists. Even this week, as you hear each other pray, play, and you say, I'm not that good. It's not what it's about. It's about being uniquely fitted for how God wants to use you. Ministry of good works for which you are uniquely fitted. And finally, I cannot leave verse 17 without offering a very important comment about the gender suggested in who is so equipped. Now, I totally realize there are various traditions, various schools of thought. I'm just going to lay my cards on the line and hope you love me. <laughs> <laughs> the gender suggested in whoso is equipped by Scripture, my version says that the man of God may be fitted, equipped. And in the New Testament original language, I can just tell you blatantly that is not accurate. It is the word anthropos, I alerted to earlier, anthropos, which means, if we use the term man at all, then man in the sense of humankind, female as well as male. If it was intended to specify man as a male, it would not use the term anthropos, from which we get the study of anthropology, the study of human beings, but rather arsenos which speaks of gender of a male. If that's what Paul meant, he would have used arsenos. But here the word is importantly anthropos. So the correct translation would be that the person of God be fitted, equipped for every good work. Or you could put it that the man or woman be fitted, equipped for every good work. Now I highlight this because we need to reference that just in the previous letter of Paul, Timothy 1, he writes one of the most seemingly severe restrictions of women that we come across in a very selected context. And many scholars upon with whom I tend to agree, well, I not tend to, I too totally agree. Now see what he does in 2 Timothy as a recentering by stressing anthropos, not arsenos. Now, I would love to talk about that with you if that's important, but to me it's very important that women know they are lifted up by the scripture in every way it is not gender based the bible affirms women every bit as much as any man as the person of god rightly fitted for any role in ministry and serving god now in the debate about all that i respect those who see it differently 
I just think they're wrong. <laughs> and I'd just be so happy to discuss that. When we think about the scripture equipping us, if we in any way follow the ways of Islam that subjects women in all sorts of demeaning ways, I mean, I could just go on and on about that. The Islamic Quranic teaching blatantly teaches that men, males, are created higher, more godlike. Than women. I don't think the Bible affirms that at all, no matter what position you take about the role of women. And so I'll just conclude to say that that is very, very different from the teaching of the Quran. When we have an interlocutor with Islamic teaching comparing and contrasting, this is a huge difference. How we think about gender and especially women and their place to serve God. There's so much more in this passage in 2 Timothy to go over, but we're going to save that for tomorrow. Come back and conclude with the opening verses that we'll reserve for tomorrow. I just want to close in prayer. And if you don't mind, I'm going to pray especially for the women here. This chamber fest happens to be largely women. I think there's three guys, is that right? <laughs> and I just want to bless you, young ladies. In my opinion, you have full freedom to be equipped in any way that God wants to lead you. Lord Jesus, thank you for these dear young women. Us guys in this room, we pray for these dear ladies who show us the image of God as we are reminded in Genesis. God made humans in his image, male and female, he made them. So that apart from these ladies, we really only see half of who God is at best. I thank you for them, and I pray you'd bless them no matter where they land in terms of roles, that they would know how firm they are, that the Bible uniquely lifts them, whereas so many other religious teachings, especially Quranic teaching, ends up degrading women, demeaning them forbidding them education. I'm so glad for the Bible, what the Bible says about itself. And I pray for these young women today, you'd encourage them to seek all that you have for them. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.